Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Strand. My name is Sabir, and I direct events here. For a little bit of history, Strand was founded in 1927 by the Bass family over on 4th Avenue's Book Row. Stretching from Union Square to Astor Place, Book Row gradually dwindled until, after over 92 years, Strand is the sole survivor. Still run by the Bass family, still housing new and used books, and running near 400 events a year. Tonight, we are excited to be welcoming Imani Perry to celebrate the release of Breathe, a letter to my sons. Her raw and honest new book examining the terror, grace, and beauty of coming of age as a black person in contemporary America. Amani is the Hughes Rogers Professor of African American Studies at Princeton University and the author of several books, including Looking for Lorraine, The Radiant and Radical Life of Lorraine Hansberry. Breathe draws on her work and life to find beauty and possibility in life, extorting her children and their peers to find courage and inspiration in black tradition while challenging society to see black children as deserving of humanity. We are also so glad to have we are so glad to have Imani with us to discuss it alongside Tracy K. Smith, the 22nd United States Poetry L Poet Laureate. Tracy's books include the acclaimed memoir, Ordinary Light, as well as three books of poetry, including last year's Wade in the Water, as well as Life on Mars, winner of the 2012 Pulitzer Prize. In addition, she's the recipient of the 2019 Annisfield Wolf Book Prize, and she is currently the Roger S. Berlin 52nd Professor in the Humanities and Chair of the Lewis Center for the Arts at Princeton University. I couldn't be more thrilled to have these two brilliant women with us tonight, so without further ado, let's welcome them to the Strand. <laughs> Hello. Good evening. Good evening. Um, so I'm going to read a little bit, but first I want to say two things. One, it's amazing to be here um, at one of the best bookstores in the world, um, and also one of the places. My father passed away about five years ago, and this is one of the places that I think of. I identify with him. Um, I first came here with him. I remember being a little girl and him saying, the, the bookstore is as big as an entire block, right? And that kind of, so. Um, and also, I am so grateful, Tracy, for you being here. Um, and um, I know you hear this all the time, but you're so extraordinary in every way. And so it's a joy and an honor. And as sweet and lovely as you are extraordinary. So, <laughs> um, so I'm just going to read really briefly, and then we'll jump into conversation. And this is um, in the midst of writing to my sons. There are fingers itching to have a reason to cage or even slaughter you. My God, what hate for beauty this world breeds. They say they are afraid. I do not believe it is fear, it is bloodlust. People will say I'm being melodramatic, they have, but police kill middle class black children and adults too. Not with the same frequency, but class is no prevention. It is a reduction of the odds at best. As a black mother, when I read about one of those children whose lives have been snatched, at first blush I think that could have been my child but I have demanded of myself that I turn away from such egotism. The truth is, that is not my child. My children are here, and they stand with me to honor their dead. When Mamie Till shared the bloated, distended face of her beautiful son, Emmett, who was murdered, she did not offer other black parents possession. Mamie Till's Pieta was one in which she could not hold his wounded but still beautiful body across her lap. Hers was a pieta instead of distended, inflamed, and bloated remains from a distance, a pieta of a mother made empty-handed by virtue of the cruelty of the execution remains with us. That funeral service, a martyrdom, sending off a patron saint for those who survive after deaths is an ever-present haunting. I have not raised you in the church. Maybe that is a mistake. Faith helps us hold on. What do you do other than pray? An intercession, not to bring the baby back, after all he is with God, but one to make stepping out of bed possible. 
Thank you. You're so gracious that you started with thanks, but I really wanted to thank you um, for writing this book. I feel like you voiced so much of what I, as a mother of black sons, mm -hmm. feel in a way that we haven't seen before. I feel like there's a, a, a tradition of men writing about mm -hmm. Their mm -hmm. sons writing to men, thinking about the history of America as a history of men. And I feel like you get into the spaces that we know are also there and that we need to speak to. Um, I want to, I was, you know, I've got my notes because it always makes me nervous to do this. So I'm going to go back and me forth. Too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but my sense reading this book is that it's lyrical, mm. associative, it nimbly spans genres and topics. It dwells in numerous registers. It's both intimate and necessarily public. You're speaking in terms of logic and something higher than logic. Mm. Um, the book, as I see it, must have been a project that allowed your mind and body and spirit to breathe in a way. Yeah. It, allow, it feels like it allowed the largeness of you to take charge in a way that when we are obedient to the fields and the genres <laughs> that we belong to, right. we, don't always, we don't always permit. Mm -hmm. um, in the afterward, you say the call to craft became stronger when you became the steward of your son's lives. So. The first thing I want to ask you is to talk a little bit about inhabiting that largeness mm -hmm. and getting past whatever might have been inhibiting um, inhibiting the choice to, to do this. Yeah. Um, oh, such a, a good and complicated question for me. I mean, I think the sense of, um, I'll say the two things in my life that from the time I was six years old I knew I wanted to do was be a mother and write. Um, and it was actually easier to step into being a mother than to actually feel um, um, the courage to step fully into being a writer. So, and I say that, it's a sort of weird thing to say because I've written a lot of books, but that the sort of ability to, to be fully creative and not to be bound up with the details of an argument Right, um, and actually to be able to say, to write in a fashion that is sort of like, I don't know, that is impressionistic in the way that we experience our intimate lives, right, um, was a process of development, right, for me through the other work and through trying multiple genres. Um, uh, but it, I mean, it feels incredibly good, and I think in some sense it's actually, you know how, you know, when we have children, right, on the first, the first, and I think the most immediate way of responding is, you know, we want to protect them in every way. So, for example, my older son, I was really pushing STEM education when he was little because he was good at, like, engineering type stuff. And then at a certain point, I was like, what am I doing? Because he's an artist, and we know the world really needs artists desperately right now. And, I, and, and, that, and so then that pivot actually was like, okay, if I want them to be able to fully be themselves, the best way to model that is to try to fully be myself, right? And, I, and there's this particular sort of motif of black mothers as long suffering, right? And everything is sacrifice, which um, in some ways is true, but then it's also, but how do you educate your children or the young people in your life to have the kind of care for you fully as a person that you have for them? Because you want them to be that way with the people in, in their lives, right? It's interesting because um, when you think about the, do the disciplines that we, you know, we love and we yeah. live in and we, we've studied our way through, um, and even the sense, the, the m means toward a kind of stability and authority, like STEM as we see it, <laughs> um, all of those things are buying into a particular kind of order and um, 
belief that, that this will pay off. This, right. is, this is going to convince the world of what is right. This is going to make a stable life for you and keep you safe. Yes. Um, the world we live in shows us that is not true. It's not true. And yeah. what's so beautiful about this book is that you call on so much that is outside of that that to me feels undeniably rooted in blackness. Yeah. The belief in the spirit and mm-hmm. the sense of, you know, yes, there is a way that suffering and love are inextricable. Yes. Um, so it's it's exciting to me that in addition to being a book that's really practical and loving, it's also kind of this archival celebration of, of the things that come from blackness that we haven't yet fully categorized. Does yeah, that make sense? Absolutely, because you know, I mean, to me, there's the we have this extraordinary tradition, right? And, my, and ideas and art, and in this moment, understandably, there's a real sort of immediate sense of the crises of vulnerability. But that's not new for Black people, and it's also not new to try to figure out um, how to love and how to create beauty in the midst of it. In fact, under greater constraint people created extraordinarily beautiful lives, right? And that, to me, is the thing to value most. It's also the most, um, there's something about, about it that you can depend on, right? I mean, that there's always something extraordinarily beautiful. And there is a connection. Some of it is about, you know, how does one make one's life meaningful in the context of degradation, in the context of, of insult, right? Um, And so I'm not, you know, we have to draw on that tradition. We have to draw as adults, but I I want to teach young people how to draw on that tradition. And both specifically black people, but also broadly, because we have a tradition that actually gives remarkable resources for humanity, period. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautifully said. I want to talk a little bit now that you mentioned those the sense of beauty. Um, I love the various legacies that you call forth and that you kind of guide your sons toward um, make beauty and love in a genocidal time. Um, you talk about wanting them to believe and and create and trust desire. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And could you, I have all these pages. Can can we get little, since I don't know if everybody's read the book. On 66, um, you talk about, there's that statement, make beauty and love in a time of genocide. Could we get like a little paragraph or something? How do you feel about that? Yeah, I mean, well, so um, again, it's sort of me, it's it's the process of becoming, right? So part it's about the process of my children becoming, but it's about my becoming as someone who is the steward of the lives of my children, right? And so I want them to experience love and pleasure and joy in all of the way, right? And so much about parenthood is often about like restraining that, right? But in fact, if if that's our disposition, we don't teach them how to do those things in a way that are actually self-nurturing and beautiful. So, right, so to think about, to say, for me to say that to them is actually about, it's okay to, to, to want joy in your life. It's okay to seek the beautiful moments um, and not to be completely driven, right, in every respect, which is hard with parents like us to not have that energy for um, our children experience that and also uh, yeah so so I wanted it to give to, to have the multiple registers of making love actually right to have romantic right physical emotional all those things I want them to to grow into a life that is joyful in that way I want to hear some of your beautiful language okay is that okay <laughs> yes um I want to hear it in your voice. Okay. Is that okay? Tell me where to go. <laughs> Tell me where to go. I want you to go to the bottom of 66. Yes, okay. I am asking you I to do something was... difficult. Oh, yes. Um, yes, I'm asking you to do something difficult, to make beauty and love in a genocidal time with a harrowing past behind you. But when was it easier? I have some tips on how to do it. Never let shame eat you up. Don't resolve it the American manhood way with violence and insult as deflection. I tell you this knowing that throughout your life this will make you a target. Betraying the rules often does. Men who don't mistreat are always at greater risk of being mistreated. 
The spirit of wounded boys is a haint, the worst possible thing that rots and turns invisible. Beware of the strategic decanter. Make pain a way to tell part of your story. Such grace will make you a full-hearted person. When you are hurt, cry. When you are humiliated, let the sadness be at least as present as the rage. Make the moments of its release be under the arm of protection a movable feast. The Lord says vengeance is mine. Give it up to God. Thank you. Um, this book is dense with um, truth, you know, mm -hmm. that's lyrical and beautiful and indelible. Um, I, I am excited for my sons to Thank become you. old enough to Thank read this and kind of live with it as a as a Bible in a way. And you know, I mean, it. I and I I don't want to like turn the I don't want to take over your, your role and turn the question <laughs> to you. But but I do think this. I mean, I don't know if you experience this, but you know, you you have sons and then you th you realize that there's something about um, patriarchy and the way American masculinity is registered that. You are both, and particularly for black boys, you are both confronting the prospect of them constantly being a victim, but also if adhering to patriarchy, being someone who is abuse, an abuser, right? And you actually have to navigate the protection and also cultivate the ethics and kindness to not do things that way. Right, that are so deeply, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's funny because sometimes in doing that and saying, I want to protect this tender, beautiful person, you find yourself recreating some modes of oppression. Does that make well, sense? Yeah. Um, or, <laughs> you know, haven't you wanted to, in fact, I know, intercede on your son's behalf when you, someone is doing him wrong? Oh, yeah. And then realizing that's that's not the job I need to do right, right. now. That's it. I, yeah, I was telling you, last night was that <laughs> my back to school night. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That was, yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and, um, right. And it, so I think that is also one of the, the, the issues. Like I remember years ago, my, and this was a different stage, right? My children were much younger, but one of my friends was talking about letting her child go into downtown Philadelphia on the train at like 10 or something. And I could not imagine, and she was a girl, she's a white girl, I could not imagine feeling like that would be safe for my children ever at that stage, right? Um, and then, I mean, so a lot of this book is about, the reality is that we cannot protect them fully. We can't. And, and actually having to accept that and also allow, and that's you know, part of why the second section is, is, is called fly, right? Letting, you know, and also letting them have the practice so that they can fly, which requires a kind of, you know, letting things go that is very difficult when you're constantly, you know, aware of all the terrifying things that might happen. Yeah. I love the descriptions of just watching your sons at joy, in yeah. flight, in their way. Mm -hmm. um, I think the honoring that is a, is a kind of protection, in a way, of the spirit, perhaps. I yeah. mean, it means there's a space where we can, um, we can be alive mm -hmm. together. We can be fully alive and, and large together um, and claim the right to that, yeah. right? Um, and it's funny because at one point, I, um, I so it's part of what, like turning to jazz for me as a metaphor for parenting or actually a, because so much of what, right, so jazz is all this discipline and then moments of improvisation and that's when the sort of magical, and like actually being able to think, oh, how does one apply that to life, right? You have all this sort of, these exercises of becoming, but then you also have to cherish that moment, in part because you don't, you don't know what's going to happen next. But I do know that it's not a good idea to live one's life totally bound up with the terror. Yeah. It makes me think a little bit. I remember when I was writing about my parents mm -hmm. and trying to, as an adult, piece together the history that I only knew in part as a child. And you know, I lost them. I lost him when I was an adult. But we hadn't, we hadn't right. talked enough. Mm -hmm. Um, and I came upon this realization. My father grew up in Jim Crow, Alabama. My father uh, came of age in a military that wasn't fully integrated. And somehow, 
it did not break him mm-hmm. you know and yeah. I think you're right that that is that's a story that we, we really need we to celebrate to. and tell yeah. I love the I want I want you to talk about the legacy that you descend from mm-hmm. you talk about there are you know seven generations of college educated family members on one side of your family not my not my family theirs okay. my children your children's <laughs> and yeah. then there's yeah. something that you yeah. describe as better or more meaningful in in some ways than prestige yes and that I love that there is this um, turning toward that again and again will you talk a little yeah. bit about that? I mean and it's so I mean I you know, it, it is, there's a part of me that thinks it's like remarkable that we're both at the same institution with the sort of Alabama, Massachusetts, yeah. right? all this kind of stuff, the same age, right? <laughs> and, and, but that there, um, you know, I, I return often to make sense of that, right? What does it mean? What did it mean? My grandmother, you know, who, who had 12 children, who, um, had a mentally ill, a g- incredibly gifted, but a pretty severely mentally ill husband. Played classical piano by ear and was first, per- you know, so he had some college education, but was in and out of institutions. And and she was a domestic and um, later worked in a hospital and sent 12 children to college out of Jim Crow, Alabama. Okay. There's something about those resources, notwithstanding the very different circumstances of my life that I understand is essential for me to pass on. And that is not about, um, that's not the same thing as like making sure my kids get in the right school at all. That's a different kind of, um, it is about excellence, right? And it is about um, sort of the cultivation of one's imagination and one's skills and one's sense of sort of personal development. Um, but it's also about like having a sense of meaning in life that isn't, that is, can be very small too. Like one of my favorite things about my grandmother and I, I, I mean, she passed away years ago and I, st- I mean, my, that grief is always active for me. It was incredibly close to her is that she loves straws. Not envi- I know she wasn't an environmentalist, but she sort of was because she didn't waste anything, right? But it was, she loved, str- like it was just the tiniest pleasure she could take great joy in. I just think that's, like that's a big part of, you know, of, of what it means to live a good life. So all of those, you know, kind of things, yeah, yeah. Um, I know that writing a book is a process of discovery. Yeah. Um, we're like the same age and all of that stuff, but when I read this book, I think, oh, she she was born with this understanding of the cosmos. <laughs> Please tell me that there were things that that the writing of this book taught you that you oh. that you maybe didn't know from the get go. Well, I learned that I prefer writing without footnotes. <laughs> a lot. <laughs> um, um, I, I, you know, I learned, because one of, the, I mean, as a, the part of me that, you know, so I'm all, I feel like I'm always an intellectual and I'm always an artist, but the part of me that is a scholar, that one of the things that I know that I do well in that respect is I can draw connections, I can see connections, right? I can see patterns, and I've always had a very kind of mathematical approach even when I'm analyzing literature. Um, and, but what I learned here is actually that, and I don't know quite, how to describe it, but I could see myself in a history of like um, black writing and th- that almost emerged organically, right? So like, so the book begins in this like very kind of intense invocation of Du Bois, but it wasn't, I, that wasn't like, you know, there's, a, there's crafting, but it wasn't like I said, now I'm going to invoke Du Bois, and now I'm going to invoke Morrison, and now I'm going to, like, it wasn't, it was, there's something about c- crafting with the, with the archive, but actually having some kind of creative flexibility that changed my relationship to the writing I loved, or my sense of my place in this genealogy that we, this tradition that, that we come from, you know? I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, but yeah. absolutely. Um, Okay, so you mentioned our, some of our ancestors. Yes. Um, I 
I just pulled a little quote of something that you you um, wrote soon after Toni Morrison passed away. Yeah. And I didn't know that we share, I mean, this could have come out of my own life. Unlike many of my colleagues and a number of my friends, I did not have a personal relationship with Toni Morrison. She had become an emeritus faculty member by the time I arrived at Princeton, gliding in for occasional events in her honor. On those evenings, in the throng of people at various dinners and events, I always tried to be appropriately gracious without displaying how awestruck and giddy I was to be in her <laughs> presence. I must admit, this is from much later in this beautiful remembrance. Um, I must admit, in the secret place, I always yearned for her blessing, mm. some words of encouragement or praise for my writing. It is a mock-worthy vanity, given the reams she must have received from the most recognized writers in the world. It was a long time before I realized that I already had her blessing. In her years of making writers, of nurturing community, of teaching as well as writing, she sermonized. Teach your story and tell it too. There is no one without the other. To riff on the great bard of black letters, Paul Lawrence Dunbar, she did a wondrous thing. She saw the writer black and bid her sing. Um, I, I felt sort of like safe in a way when I read that because every time, <laughs> all that week and every time I, I feel like I'm always apologizing right. for loving her so much that I was terrified oh, absolutely. to, <laughs> to yeah. tell her, to, to you know, approach her in a more than cordial way. Mm -hmm. But you but really you know that some of our of home training too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, is it like, right? I mean, maybe yeah. she knew, maybe she knew that. Um, but I love the sense of inheritance that you, identify and that you claim. Yeah. I feel it in this book in mm -hmm. so many ways, in the way that you, you move through those different registers and worlds, mm -hmm. the way that your sense of the small interior spaces, um, the women and the, the spirit mm -hmm. layer of existence is, um, is codified as history, is codified yeah. as a kind of method mm -hmm. of black experience or a modality or something like that. Yeah, I mean, so, you know, one of the things that, um, oh gosh, yeah, the, and you know, there's so many ways, and it really is the case that every single thing that I write of any sort is affected by Morrison, right? I mean, I think she's the greatest like novelist in the history of American letters. I don't think there's any comparison, frankly. Um, but there's also, like there's, so for example, the sections of the book both track um, um, Native Son, Richard Wright, Native Sons, and, and Ta-Nehisi Coates did a, had the similar sort of structure in Between the World and Me, um, but I, ch I changed, you know, f um, flight to fly, and I changed um, fate to fortune very deliberately. And part of that was actually me sort of being in the space of Margaret Walker, and the daughter of Alabama, um, although she moved to Mississippi. Mississippi always in their like writers festivals are like, they claim her, and I'm like, she's from Birmingham. Um, but you know, her effort to try to make sense of the anguish that Richard Wright experienced, right? so he's, I mean, I was so moved when I wrote about um, Lorraine Hansberry, uh, one of the things she would say is that, you know, his sort of tragedy of his sort of deep ambivalence about black people destroyed the fact that he, she saw him as the greatest writer in the history of American letters. She was like, Faulkner has nothing on Wright. Um, and Faulkner is, I mean, you know, who Faulkner is, but Wright and his ability to capture, so like I was trying to like be with Margaret Walker in how she tried to make sense of how what Wright was grappling with and offer something different, right? And so, yeah, so it's like sort of actually trying to step into these moments of interface in a loving way as opposed to like a, um, an ar a confrontational and argumentative way, but to think, okay, so we see these, some of these things differently. Um, and there is the, you know, the, the feminine part of it that is a kind of the, the nurturing, the tenderness, trying to care through suffering. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I'm just, I, I want to ask if you think, um, you know, this is a moment where we're taught, we hear, or there are many conversations that are about the, you know, vulnerability of humanities study 
Um, do you feel like this writing this book has changed you as a scholar? Do you mm. does it give you a sense of ways that scholarship might yes. move? Yeah, I mean, I you know, I, I would say I I never really did scholarship completely conventionally, and always got some sort of pushback about that. Um, I do think that there is something dishonest about the pretense that we are not deeply emotionally invested in everything that we produce. Um, and so, you know, and I see lots of people doing this in different ways. I mean, I think it's really beautiful the way people, and, and it is, there are particularly a lot of black women who are mixing genres or who are blending like kind of really serious academic study with, you know, curiosity and imagination. And I think that that's much more honest. You know, there is, the, the, the objectivity is a fiction. None of it is objective. Rigor we need, right? right? Like, so you don't just say whatever is out there, right? You try to actually be serious about what you're studying. But, so I, I do think that we have to push that mm -hmm. shift from the fiction of objectivity to the embrace of rigor. Yeah, I think that, that fiction of objectivity is also something that um, people of color have been held to in a way that's, you know, just imbalanced. Yeah. Right. Oh, yeah. Um, You're emotional. <laughs> <laughs> Stop being so emotional about, you know, yeah. all this death and destruction. How dare you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Objectivity <laughs> is a way of saying back away from that, that claim. Yeah. Let, me, let me create a space to neutralize it, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's one, yeah. one perhaps unwitting <laughs> effect of the, mm -hmm. the cry for objectivity. Um, to go in a really different direction, I love the way that you talk about faith, belief, mm -hmm. religion, even ambivalence toward the community of religion, yeah. um, the vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, you're very Emersonian. In fact, you quote Emerson at one point in the book, <laughs> urging your sons to, to write their own Bible, to bring yeah. everything to themselves that can be generative, consoling, mm -hmm. healing. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Also in terms of yourself yes. as a younger person and, and now your sense of faith as something to offer in, in any way. Yeah, I mean, and, you know, I'm really angsty about the fact that I haven't raised my children in not just that church, any church, right? Um, but I made a decision, and I don't talk about this in an explicit way, but um, the church I belong to in Boston when I was in graduate school is one of the churches that was closed because of this abuse scandal. Um, my priest was not, what, but you know, they had, to they had to pay for all of the violence they'd done. To, and I, I just thought, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a third generation Catholic, but I, I, I can't, I cannot have my children baptized in this institution that treats children in this way. And I actually had that experience repeatedly with thinking about religious institutions, right? So even though I personally experienced something really profound in the celebration of mass because, and I have a very different, I have a, I don't agree with the ideology behind and doctrine of Catholicism. I experienced something in the collective body, right? But that's not something that I thought I could impose. And I, because that would be a contradiction of my values. Right, and so that's something they have to, if they want to have, I mean, it's sort of like being American, right? Like I'm really not good with this project, but I am, I am Amer I'm, I'm American, right? But that's, you know, at a certain point that became a choice, right? And so, and I, I do think we have, to, that's a sort of personal process of reconciliation with these institutions or places that we belong to, but we understand are not just flawed, but like, but violent. Can yeah. you, um, you, you phrased something so beautiful, living as prayer. Yes. Um, it's on 133. Can we go to that passage? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, wait. Which part? Oh, okay. So many came before me. That is the mother's legacy from whence I come, praying women. At one point in my life, I attempted to pray unceasingly, constantly saying the rosary to myself at the back of my mind. That was a really intense discipline, actually. Living is prayer. I think that is when I am at my best, because seeing through prayer provides a remarkable clarity. 
not in the doctrinal sense, but because it is, at best, the lens of a love for every tattered inch of this earth. I feel right. like that's so Thank beautiful. Um, but it is, right? You, I mean, I feel like when I'm in that space, whether it's, and I think it has different iterations, right? Meditation, chanting, prayer, right? Quiet reflection, being with nature. You, you become more fully human because all of these preoccupations that are so bound up with the way the world is structured and trying to navigate it kind of, um, they recede Right. And I think it may, there's a kind of, there's an interior gentleness and love and care that, that can m- emerge. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think for me personally, it, it changes my mode of interaction with other human beings. Yeah. I, I love that. I love the sense of love for every tattered inch of this earth. Um, and again, for me, it takes me back to the sense of, of the many le- levels and layers of black life that mm. we embrace as so beautiful, mm-hmm. though some are riddled with pain and some are um, start in a place of, of deep loss. I started to feel an urgency in terms of needing faith, needing to pray when I had children yeah. because I felt like I can't, I can't protect them, like you said, at every moment. I can't, mm-hmm. I can't outdo any kind of um, peril or obstacle. Yeah. Um, and so it became this charge to find something that could that could help them to last in a way. And somehow the sense of, of prayer and looking at the world through this other perspective helps yeah. in a way. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and, and, one of the, and we talked about this a little bit um, in, in the green room, but, you know, the, the for... When I had children, in the first, my, for, and I realized that my grandmother's first child died as a child, um, in part because he had rheumatic fever, and you know he was given an incorrect medi- dosage of medication, is what I've been told, which was not, and it was the leading cause of death for black children in, in that period, for children period, um, and you know obviously inadequate medical care was um, common, and I. And I realized that I could not understand how she could be the person she was because she, I mean, she really was my ideal of motherhood. I mean, just unbelievable love and resilience. And I, how, and I just, how did she do this? You talk about how could she even allow herself to love those other children as much, having lost right. in that way. But she did, right? Um, and in some ways, it's like... Um, that, of course, that's an invocation of Morrison's beloved, and the you know the the children who are gone, and you know she just the only thing she remembers about one is the burnt bottom of bread, the, the, the baby like the burnt bottom of bread, like what it means to go on after the ch- the child is gone, which is so much a part of the legacy of black motherhood in this country, right? Um, so there's so that, and some of that is a, her dis- her prayerful disposition. I came to realize, right, which did not mean she wasn't frequently suffering in anguish. It's not a, it's, you know, it's not a sentimental relationship. Right. Yeah, it's really, yeah. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of translation, right, mm-hmm. of something. Um, I love the way that, you know, loss is a part of this, and, and there's almost a spiritual math or something that I feel at different moments. Um, let me find my notes. Um, In, in terms, and in speaking to your uncle, Boot, the tribe increases no matter what. Um, and speaking to the death of your father, it was his time to rest. It is our time to struggle. Mm-hmm. Um, I really, there's something, can you talk a little bit about your yeah. sense of the generations? Um, yeah. What we are paying mm. into, what we're, there's something really, um, powerful about that perspective. Yeah, I mean, and I should say, you know, um, and I mentioned this briefly, but I really had, I mean, I'm just now emerging from a pretty intense 10 year period of grief. And um, that felt at times quite overwhelming. And part of my way of sort of making my way through that was thinking about 
not just sort of the memory. In some ways, in some moments, the memory of the people I'd lost actually sort of made me crumple. But, but stepping into the things they did or the way they did them, right, that actually allowed me to feel present with them in, in a way that was very different from memory, right? Um, and so... Um, and so if I was, you know, so if I'm, <laughs> if I'm in the kitchen cleaning with bleach, my younger son will say, oh my goodness, you just like Aunt Bobby, right? <laughs> right, and, and then, you know, so then, right, and it is me, and I'll sometimes, and then, you know, I will, my children say, oh, I know you're missing Medea, that's what we call my grandmother, if you, when you wear one of her robes, right, because I'll wear like a pink, old-fashioned pink house coat around, right, but it's, so, so there's a very kind of corporeal sense of ge generation for me, Right, as well as actually like taking their lessons. And one of, I, I mean, I haven't ever published this, but I actually have written a lot, like sort of the things my grandmother used to say, and like they have become, become part of my vocabulary. So it's like sort of this, yeah, so the stepping into um, the generation, the, the inheritance, right? And I, I see that as the fortune I have to offer my children. It's not, not monetary. <laughs> Great, <laughs> but I do. I, I, you know, I have this trove, this ancestry to offer them. Yeah, yeah I feel that so powerfully. I want to keep talking, but I know there are other people who have questions. Okay, I'll be. I'll share. <laughs> so, if you'd like to ask a question, if you could raise your hand, I can run the mic right on over to you. As a question to start, uh, was there anything? And you don't necessarily have to speak to it. You felt you couldn't put in the book, and oh, so yeah. why? Yeah, I mean, so s there's um, one of the things that I, I write about is an experience of assault. Um, and I don't, I made a decision to write about that, it, that particular experience that was, and I say in the book, this is not the worst thing that ever happened to me. Um, because I, what I wanted to do was to communicate that one of the things, and this is particularly around gender, that we have to socialize boys and men into is a kind of sensitivity to, in the sense of fully seeing some of the, that it, these experiences in a way that, are, that is not about a rageful response, whether it is internalized because these experiences have happened to them, right? But masculinity says you can't be vulnerable. Or it's like, and I talk about, you know, the instance I described, my father wanting to like go out on the streets with a baseball bat and find the dude, right? And I was like, that's actually, like I, and I love him for that, but that's actually not the care work, right? And so, so I wanted to talk about that, but I'm not going to talk about um, many of the most painful things that have occurred in my life because I don't, the exercise isn't really like the like give you everything. It's about actually how to make the point, right? And sometimes that does require like some really, really intimate revelation, but other times I think you get there without that as a, as a right, yeah. So maybe in fiction some of that will. Yeah. <laughs> All my friends in here. Hey. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask you about the supernatural. Uh, you mentioned the other books that are like this, that were written like this. And the ones written by men as opposed to women, the women seem to have much more of a supernatural bend to them. Yeah. And, um, and you spoke to the generational uh, thing, which I think is part of that. So if you could speak to that in some way. Sure. I mean, I think there's a lot more space, just in terms of the way gendering works in society, to be kind of witchy for women. <laughs> um, but I also think, you know, and some of this actually came through my conversations with, with Josh, like, over, the, over years, is that, you know, so, so part of what I'm, 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 for me, I'm getting at in sort of responding, like, I, I saw, I was very deliberate about that. And actually, in um, Morrison's Song of Solomon, right, so much of the novel is the process of an aunt teaching, right, the nephew to to see like what what it really means to have a meaningful existence that isn't connected to the trappings of patriarchy, right? And so there's a twinning for me between that 
and so Baldwin's letter to his nephew, which is about seeing sense, like being sensitive to your elders, right. right? And Morrison, who I think is actually riffing on Baldwin in that in that novel, right, where the aunt is teaching the nephew to also to aspire to love um, and a sense of self that isn't bound up with revenge and accumulation, right? And so, so yeah, so, and, and actually that is about, like, you know, that, that quote that gets passed around the internet, right, where he, at the very end of the novel, he says, you know, if you, you know, it, you could ride the air, right? If you, yeah, right? That's, so that, and that, so that is, that requires some supernatural stuff, right? Because, yeah. <laughs> Hi, Dr. Perry. Good to see you again. Uh, over. Hey, Adam. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> Good. Um, so my question questions for you are, <laughs> when did your sons know you were writing the book? And also, what did they think about being written about? Yeah. And also for in the text? So they knew I was writing it when we were in Japan, living in Japan last summer. Because um, what I would do is, you know, because the, the calendar, the schedule, so my older son never wanted to get adjusted to the to schedule in Kyoto because he wanted to talk to his friends on Instagram. <laughs> so, so the schedule was always off, right? And then my younger son would like, he was so excited about being able to like just be in the street. So he would like wander the streets of Kyoto late at night. So anyway, so all that to say I had like four hours to write in the morning. <laughs> um, so they, when they would, you know, get up, they would see, you know, so I talked to them about, about it all the way through. Part of the reason the book is not more humorous is that um, my younger son, who's really hilarious, for those of you who are my Facebook friends, you probably know this, um, was like, you can't put any of the crazy stuff I say in this book. Oh. So I was like, okay. And there were a lot, there were a number of things that they vetoed, right? So they, I, I went through everything. I'm sure that it's still going to be a problem emotionally at some point, which is part of why I say in the book, like, listen, I hope that there's space for them to answer me because I, and I, that's because I have friends whose mothers have written about them and it was hard, right? So, so it's like, so as much as they say they're okay with it now and they were through the process, it, there's prob it's probably gonna be funky at some point, especially when other people, they meet people who are like, I know you. And they'd be like, no, actually you don't, right? Um, you know what my mother thinks of me, right? And to understand there's a distinction there. Yeah, I'm sorry, that, was that, was that it? Okay, all right. <laughs> Good evening. Hey. <laughs> um, so I actually have a couple questions, but before I get to them, first, thank you for writing this. <laughs> 100. So my first question uh, kind of takes us back to this page 66 um, and this line: "I want to hold you safe. I also want you to fly." It just really made me think about my mother's parenting experience and how. I mean, she t at this point she has even told me that a lot of my young years were kind of guided by what she felt was safe and by what she felt was, was comfortable. Um, mm -hmm. You know, not so much for me, but for herself. And ah, so yeah. I just want to hear a little bit more about your vocabulary for describing that, navigating that. And then my other question is, question. you know, the title of this book, or a subtitle, if you will, is A Letter to My Son. So I know that you want you know, your progeny, both direct and metaphorical, to read this. And I was just wondering a little bit more about what you'd like, to, what you'd like people to put this in context with. Yeah. You know, what would you like people to co-read this with? Yeah, um, oh, it's a beautiful question. I think that the first one is really, um, I mean, I'm trying to be honest about what you described your mother experienced, right? That there, there is, I want to be honest about that tension. Right, because, and I think it is a tension that is pretty universal. Right, so depending on your life circumstances, sometimes you hold even more closely. Right, but it's not that we don't want our children to bloom. Right, and so that, and this question of comfort is it too? Like how, how far does that go? Right, what does it mean when the blossoming happens in ways that are unfamiliar to us or that feel frightening to us? Right, those kinds of um, 
I think I think it is helpful to be honest about that, to not just be like, oh yes, you know, this is it's not it's not easy, in part because there's an impulse, protect, particularly in the society, and this is something that that y'all talked about in this time, is um, this sort of the the sense of the child as possession and creation, right? I'd be listening, uh, <laughs> right? And, and so that you know, trying to be. Um, to, to, to let go of that is a process. It's not just an app. Um, and then the, your, your second question about the conversation part, it's complicated for me because, I'll be completely honest, um, the way I think a la the landscape of writing now tends not to be sort of thinking about writing in the context of a tradition. And that's really what I think about, right? And the way we talk about books being partnered or in con is so much about marketing so often, right? And so, you know, so like for example, the phenomenon of this is the next so-and-so. No, it's not, <laughs> right? this is a different person. Or if it's a person who conceives of themselves as the next so-and-so, they're actually limiting their imagination of who they are, right? So I very much think, I mean, the, the tradition that I'm trying, I want readers to think, to be able to feel my connection to Morrison, to Wright, to Hansberry, to Bald, all these, these people, and to Emerson, um, Emily Dickinson, right, uh, who, are, who are here, who all speak to me very deeply. Um, but I don't, I don't want it to ever come across like, you know, that's a, mar that's a marketing thing, you know? Or that I'm trying to be, like, be um, sort of promoted as the next version of X, Y, or Z. Hi, Money. How are hey. you doing? Hey, how you doing? I'm good. First, I want to thank you just for uh, stunning prose. It's refreshing uh, <laughs> and revitalizing and important. And uh, as a graduate student, you always told me to pay attention to the beautiful sentence. So it's amazing to continue to see you practicing what you preach. Uh, so that's the first you. thing. No, no worries, no worries. <laughs> All right. But I want to talk about Morris in a little bit. Yeah. Because it strikes me that you're making a real intervention and maybe straining against Morrison, at least in terms of the way I read motherhood in her novels. So I'm thinking about yes. Eva Peace, first and foremost, right? Like, sets her son on fire. Yeah. Right? And then I'm thinking about Milkman Dead, who's come oh. up already, right? And is, whose very name sort of bears... Um, the haunting of his mother, sort of a. Abuse. She had. She makes him carry yeah. her suffering yeah. in an abusive fashion, right? Yeah. For the rest of his life, right? Yeah. So it strikes me that you're kind of making an intervention into Morrison in a way that yeah. almost calls to mind the end of Mama's Baby, Papa's Maybe, eh? Like this final paragraph where Spillers talks about the black male community, the United States, having the unique opportunity to say yes to the female within because of our mothers. Yes. Right. That we've been uniquely handed by them. Yes. So I wanted to ask, how do you see yourself maybe a uh, and it's a tall order, maybe, but triangulating yeah. Morrison and Spillers with the work you're doing at this book, yes. both at the craft level, but also the larger um, sort of ideological intervention I think you're making. Yeah, uh, yes. I miss seeing you all the time, <laughs> right? Um, yeah, I mean, so that's, so part of the, um, I, I, what I would say I might think of it not necessarily as an intervention, but actually having read, you know, Morrison is really a cautionary tale yes. about bad mothering over and over and over again, <laughs> right? Like, I mean, over and over and over again, you see the disaster that comes from mothers making the, their, their children suffer their suffering, mm -hmm. right? And so I feel like I have learned from, from that. Mm -hmm. As well as learning from the mothers in my my mother mothers in my family for, who have modeled um, you know just extraordinary care. So that's a piece of it. But it's both. It's the the spillers like embrace the monstrosity in the sense that the thing that you think that has been the thing that people have said is wrong about black people, which is so often that black people don't do gender right because black people don't have access to full access to patriarchy, is actually the thing that might free you, mm. right? Yeah. To, to be more fully. And, and um, an article, I can't think of the name of it, but that Angela Davis wrote in 1970 when she was in prison, where she's like, oh, I mean, she has this, this she's this reflection, she said, the fact that actually black people couldn't sort of be proletariat in the conventional sense because of be, 
has a and and then having patriarchy sort of imposed in particular is it opens up possibility so i do like that's a big theme for me it's a big part of my book vexy thing like is right is that you know let's let's use what is seen as deficient as actually part of a way to think about freedom or different kinds of relationships to each other, yeah. right? Like a more ethical set of human relations. So yeah, thank you. I mean, that's, yeah, that's it. Hi. Hey, Jeremy. <laughs> <laughs> um, nope. I'm really interested in hearing or just hearing about your thoughts around parsing interracial like intergenerational thoughts about love um, specifically like I I think there's an understanding broadly speaking that like love looks differently looks different among different generations specifically how it's passed down from mothers and fathers to specifically black sons yeah um, and I guess I would really love to hear your thoughts around how you parse that mm -hmm. and how you decided what you wanted to pass on to your sons, specifically thinking about the tradition of slavery and yeah. thinking about the tradition of, to be exact, I'm thinking about abuse. I'm thinking about hitting your kids. I'm thinking oh, about yeah. how, like, mm -hmm. whether or not you choose to yeah. um, mm -hmm. beat your kids with a belt and thoughts right. like that, right? Just like, about and this. that looks like love <laughs> yeah. sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't, right? How do you define yeah. that for your sons? Yeah. Um, and your thoughts around that, what you want to pass down and yeah. wanted them to understand. Yeah, thank you. I was just telling Rachel this other... So I come from the unique family where um, my grandmother didn't hit any of her 12 children, and my mother never hit me. Um, no, that's not true. She, she, she once slapped me because I was trying to get out of the bathtub and was in danger, and so she gave me a quick lick on my leg, and that's literally the only time. So, um, but in other ways, very, very conventional. Um, so I'm gonna tell like two short stories to get at your question. So one is, um, and I, this was before I was born, um, when my grandfather passed, the obituary, obituary read, he is survived by sons, um, Cornelius and Eugene, and 10 daughters, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> and my mother and her siblings were furious, right? But, so that, which was a kind of privileging, right, of, 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 of them being boys, men at that point, but they didn't have access to the same kind of intimacy that the daughters did, right? Those, my uncles were not around the kitchen table talking late into the night. So what I want to do is to give them access to that intimacy and give up the sort of, the, the privileging that is sort of like a sort of model, a kind of patriarchal model, right? That's, um, and I think of that, but I learned a lot, I learned a lot about how to love them through the, that kitchen table late at night. Right, that kind of intimacy, and I was fortunate in my family, I think partially because I was really, really well behaved, I was allowed to be in the kitchen early on. I know, so I was the person who my grandmother passed her life stories on to, so I, you know, so I was a witness really, early. So, so that is something that I want, so we, we do that, right? And I don't have a sense that because they're boys, they don't participate in that, right? So I think, so for me, it's like sort of how do you, and I think about this all the time, how do you liberate? There are beautiful things that are associated with gender. How do you liberate them, though, so that they aren't, people aren't boxed into them, right? So how does everybody have access to valor, right? Or chivalry, right? Or, or you know, or nurturing, right? And so that it's not about, like, confines, but actually opening up doors, yeah. Hi, and Hi. thank you very, very much for this <laughs> book. You. I am looking forward to reading it. Thank you. I am a mother of two sons as well. And I think in listening to you and part of my expectation and excitement about it is that in the hustle and the anxiety of raising black sons in this environment, you don't actually think very much about what you're doing. You just do. Yeah. And um, I don't know that, although a pretty purpose, you know, a purpose-driven type of person and in my work and in other parts of my life, I don't know that um, motherhood was something that I 
thought that much about while doing it. Yeah, yeah. And so I very, very much look forward to the very scholarly approach that you have. By that I mean mm -hmm. you taking the time to dissect it yeah. mm -hmm. and to think about what lessons you've been able to to uh, put forth. So as I said, I, I'm really Thank happy about, th about this book. I'm happy to take a moment as my sons are, you know, still here. Mm -hmm. And I have, uh, my anxieties remain because that's the other thing that I think is really interesting that it doesn't go away. That's right, yeah. Like at what age do you stop wondering? I, what age do you stop wondering, did he get home? Right. You know, I can't even get home. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the thought of my, I sort of freak out because my older son is going to college in two years about the idea that I won't know when he's home, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right? And that will be for the rest of his life for the most part, <laughs> right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I, I appreciate what you said, and I think part of it for me is, so I think, and this is across the board, there's so much sense of, of shame and guilt and inadequacy attached to mothering so much, right? And it has a particular dimension for black mothers. And so sort of like, for me, this has been a process of shifting. And I still have, it's, there's angsty moments about, oh, I don't wash the dishes every night. I don't. I mean, it drives my mother crazy when she comes to visit. She's like, how can you have your kitchen like this? Some, some nights I don't wash the dishes. Um, and, you know, I, I, but I will decide to sit down and talk to them instead, right? Um, or write instead. Um, but some of it has been for me shifting the, because the, there's a lot of time and energy that we spend worrying and then thinking about what we did wrong, right? Like to shift that towards being intentional, <laughs> you know, about care and also intentional and in caring for ourselves. Because there's, I mean, I'm const and now I'm constantly telling, but there's a lot of ways to mother well. There's a lot of ways to nurture well. There's a lot of, you know, um, Ter well, one of the things my mother always said to me that was really, really useful for me in my life is unfortunate things happen to everybody. Right? Um, and it was a way, it, like, and so as a mother, like, once you accept that, that, that's not, you know, when you know that you can't keep the unfortunate things from happening to your child. And so then it's sort of, well, how do I try to teach my child to weather that and also to withstand it? And for me, too. Because sometimes the unfortunate things do create moments where I'm not the best I could be with them, right? That gets kind of like a, a tenderness. Um, yeah, but thank you. Thank you. We have time for one final question. Hey. Hi, how are you? Nice <laughs> I'm to see good. You. How are you doing? I'm well. Good to see you. Uh, thank you for this. This has been brilliant. Um, I was curious, about, or I am curious about how you thought about um, time, uh, about temporality, about uh, what it meant to write a book like this, um, reflecting on who you were um, early on as a parent and who your sons were, um, who they were at the moment when you were writing it, but also um, and who you were at that moment, right? That was last summer, right? Yeah. And then who you um, who you will become, who they will become moving forward, right? Um, does that make sense? Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm curious how you... Um, what your consideration was around that as you were composing the book? You know, um, I did not think about it in the way that you describe um, nearly as much as I wish I had. So one of the things I keep when I've gone back to read, when I did the audio book, <laughs> it was really hard because I kept editing myself. And then I, they were like, no, you have to say to the text, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but they're different now than when I wrote the book. And I'm different, right? And um, the part of what I was trying to get at in terms of time in the composition is to, to have, to leave the impressionistic feeling when you're in that rush of every day, like, that kind of like, uh, and then also the feeling of when you're up all night worrying, right? Like, or praying, right, or trying to find, like, having the text move the reader through those universal emotional experiences in family life, which, are, which is a different kind of time than, than the other time, like of moving through years, 
right? And they say, you know, that whole, that old cliche, right? The days are long and the years are short, right? So, but the cycle of a book moves through the years and not the days, right? So there's a kind of tension between, right? Which I think is part of why they're like, they're completely disinterested at this point in this book, <laughs> right? I mean, so they were more interested when I was right, but now they're like, whatever, that happened, right? <laughs> that was a, boom, yeah. I, I love that question about time. I think when you're young, like your sons, our children are, you are, immune to time. You don't fully believe in it. And so it's not as, as much of a pressing reality as I think when you're older. And for me, that became true once I became a mother. But what I love about the way that your book behaves is that it, it believes in the phenomenon of time in the same way that poems do. It yes. moves toward what is useful. So all of all of your life and all of the lives that you are aware of and have some kind of access to become resources to you when they're needed. Yes. And you oh, create yeah. these really beautiful kinds of um, connections between things that are separated by generations. Mm -hmm. um, and you teach us to do that. And I think that's something that when your sons enter into the reality of time the way that, you know, we all will, I think that's a, a huge gift. Thank you. And, you know, I'll just be, I'll, like, offer a little confession. I remember when I started reading Those of You Who Were in the Dark Room, and first of all, they, I was like, I am not writing poetry anymore. <laughs> I give up. Right. But, but that precise thing of a way of connecting with histories and lives in ways that were very specifically black, absolutely, like, that is... Um, a part that is something that I've witnessed and tried to absorb in different ways. So I so appreciate that you saw that. <laughs> yeah. Well, Imani, I want to thank you for your generosity tonight, your beautiful words, and um, I don't know. You've given us so much. I, I I want everyone to read this book. I want I want the world to read this book. I want America to listen to the truth that you are clearly and vulnerably offering. Um, and I'm just so grateful. So thank you. Thank you.